He wants to move, but he can't make the hill there. I bet you if he got it up there, it'd make it down, though. Oh, it's 6 o'clock. It's not 5, it's 6. Do you guys need a chair? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. All those in favor? One, two, three. It's carried. Business. The agenda says we have no minutes. No, we have minutes. We have I mean, we have no business. Uh, reports. Um, it says here, Matterhorn, Stanwood Fire Pond Party. Matterhorn has a full sprinkler system. Yes. And I uh, had a conversation with John, I don't remember his last name, who is a member of the Star Wars Association who was down there with his loppers proceeding to cut back the, the um, uh, what are they, what are those little trees that grow in there? Alders? Or? Alders, yeah, the alders, I can never got he was cutting back the alders, and, and yeah, I had a very nice conversation with him, and I explained my understanding and my experience with that whole thing, and, you know, that um, he said, well, he said, we certainly don't, you know, we certainly want this to, to not to be an issue, um, and so they were going, he was going to continue doing it, I offered my help with the tractor to move all the brush he had cut down because it was right in the snowmobile trail, but he, he um he went and did it and he said that we're they're planning on you know at some point getting somebody in there probably won't be till the next spring and I told him I says Missouri Fire Department has the, has the stand fight you know we I I wouldn't cut that thing off because I wasn't going to make it it wasn't going to be a liability you know being as it was um so I went and cut it off and brought it down to the station so um he said I said Dougie Jones did it the last time. So, you, you know, you can call cross excavation and see. And he said probably it won't get done until the springtime. So that, and then that being said, I did I did talk to Joelle, and she had talked to Matt from the Matterhorn, and lawyered, he lawyered it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that, that's all I know. Yeah, Joelle reached out to the state fire marshal, and that's where she got the report that it was fully... According to the state fire marshal, it's fully sprinkled. It's fully sprinkled, and it all says that the state fire marshal is happy. She's happy. Yeah. So was the fire pond only for the Matterhorn, or for, was it for Starwood too? It, uh, see, that's how, like how a show. Time you have great. how much time you have to listen to a long story. Yeah, you know, that, that is such a great area because it was my understanding that when Roger came and did Starwood, that that was an existing fire pond. They weren't going to be able to piggyback off the one over in Vista that, um, that, that we said no, but that that fire pond would be a viable source, because this is after the whole issue with the, with the sprinkling within the Matterhorn and that pond not being maintained. So, um, but they, Roger, was, for Starwood, was going to use that fire pond and keep, keep it up. And I know for a fact that he did have it dredged once, and then, um, what's his name, who owns the Buffy Eddie? Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, he was, uh, he was, he bought Roger's house and lived there, and then he had it dredged once. And, and then, and even if you go back further than that, if you, if you look at the planning board review for the Matterhorn, it never... The fire pond was not in the review. A cistern with a well was what was approved by the planning board. And if you go and look at the building permit that was issued, it too says cistern, six, I think it says 6,000 gallons, a well, a drilled well, 6 gallon, 6,000 gallon cistern. No fire pond. So when did the fire pond come well, in for Star Well, that was in the June. Of, never that, that was in June of '97. And then the next piece of correspondence that I found in the files around here was uh, a letter from the fire chief at the time, which was Tink, to I don't know if it was to I think it was. I think it was to whom it may concern. Delphina Inc. Or Delphina Inc. That, yeah. the, that, the, that the fire, it started, it talked about this fire pond, uh, which just, um, just materialized. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's no proof that a drilled well and the, and the cistern was ever put in place. 
So my my conclusion was that that Roger opted for the cheaper of the two routes and went in and put in a fire pond without ever. Well, it probably thinking. never got recorded. It probably came before the planning board. The planning board said okay, but but it never got recorded. Even the building permit says that. Right. And then the state fire marshal issued a permit to Manahorn, and the fire the permit that the state marshal that the fire marshal issued in big black letters says not sprinkled. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's interesting to see that it's sprinkled down. And then jump forward to 2005 when Starwood Subdivision was brought before the board in the section that it dealt in the review for firefighting. It said existing fire pond. Right. So Starwood, the Starwood Subdivision was approved with the existing fire pond. Existing, excuse me, existing approved at fire pond, as it was in the... They put the word in? I don't know who approved it. And then, uh, but, there was never any covenants created in the subdivision that required that Starwood partake in any responsibility whatsoever towards maintenance of the fire pond. And That's since the my and since the fire pond is a hundred percent on the Manohorn's lot, by default, the Manohorn is responsible for the maintenance of that fire pond. Right. Although Starwood certainly would be interested in it, but they they could sit there. And well, they're the ones that have maintained it. I mean, you well, know. yeah. Well, it sounds like various people have maintained it. Well, right, but, right, but. As it is right now, though, it's a there's a fire pond there. It's supposed to have like 240,000 gallons of water. Yeah, it is severely silted in such that now it's all nothing but cattails. So it's it's basically useless at the moment. Right. Right. Well, so and, and it was it was just it, it, there's an interesting story here. And whatnot. And, and then I can't, I honestly can't remember, I mean, because I don't know if that's when I was just kind of getting started with, I mean, I thought that I had already been pretty much, because Gary was chief and, and I was, I was writing all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, so, and there's a, and there's a letter from the secretary of the, of the fire department, which was, I mean, Liz Peacock. I'm sorry? Liz Peacock. Could be. Again, to whom it may concern that the fire pond at the, at, at this address has approximately 240,000 gallons of water. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Well, that's not Cisco's from before? From no, no, before. That, no, no. That was a separate letter back in the early 2000s or something like that. So. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I was writing all that stuff, and then I would say, like, you know, maintenance of the fire pond. Right. But the, you know, the bottom line is there's a fire pond there now. There's enough correspondence on the record that shows that been acknowledged by the fire department as being existing. So whether or not, I don't know where the sprinkler system that is in the Matterhorn draws its water from, that I don't know. I'm not privy to that. But the fire pond's there, the Starwood depends on it. Actually, if you have 240,000 gallons, that's much more water than's over in the Vista View fire pond. It would be a good, well, so we had, we had only re, uh, required a forty thousand gallon year round um, supply. Right, exactly. And, that, and that's that's why there are some ponds that are more, way more, right. and some ponds that are like you know the one on Monkey Brook is like mm, yeah, not even close to that. <laughs> yeah, probably about twenty gallons. But yeah, so that that's when the, and that was a, a, and, and so I mean Roger, I mean when he, when we did it, he did a nice job with it. But like I say, and then the cattails took over, and then right. that's well, what it needs to be maintained. Right, right, and and trying to get then that's the whole thing now where somebody else that was here before wouldn't lift a finger to even do anything about maintenance, and you know Alan would go around with his little buzz saw, Sally saw, and trim up some stuff around it, hydrant heads and stuff like that. But so, none, none of these people would, would would take ownership of doing it. So so where we stand now is the town's got I don't know twenty some fire ponds. Twenty no, yeah, uh, maybe maybe a dozen. Oh, I, I would say I think it's probably more like a dozen. Yeah. That are in various states. Some are are very very functional, such as the one up in Powder Ridge, up on 
on the, the top steamboat or whatever that that one is. On Powder Ridge. On Powder Ridge. Way up on Powder Ridge. Halfway. That's a, the, the, way, way. the one. The one that goes. Yeah, that goes up towards yeah, the Pulaski. Yeah. The one by the dumpsters. Right. But the one down at the bottom of Douglas Road is totally overgrown. Yeah. That was the Baker experience, too. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's a code enforcement, it's a, it's a select board code enforcement issue. Yep. Hmm. Unfortunately, we cannot go after <laughs> Well, the town's got enough tax dollars. We could actually work. Well, I think I think the lesson learned for the planning board is in the future is uh, to follow up, and if the fire plan is required, then also require that draft covenants, et cetera, et cetera, that that stipulate the maintenance responsibilities are also made part of the stipulation for approval. Right, and like I said, I mean, right this time it was just that you know that the association would maintain. Um, the fire pond, and it, I think it was, you know, from weeds and overgrowth and stuff like that. But it, 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 none of that ever, ever got enforced. Right. And it never got, and legally, it never got documented. Right. You know, so, you Except know, in the letter from the fire department. Or, or, or there was a letter from Roger to the town saying, I hereby give you in perpetuity access to the fire right. pond for, for, for public safety purposes. But under a new owner, the owner can sit there and say, hey, well, that, uh, that, that doesn't hold a lot, you know, that. That's what I was just going to ask. So if a, if a development piggybacks on the fire pond that's already there, but then the original landowner sprinkles but other developments. We ha I do not believe that we have allowed a subdivision or association or to, to piggyback off of another one. I do not believe we have Starwood. Done. Starwood was. Starwood. Well, Starwood, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was Roger, because Roger owned the Matterhorn. Roger owned the... Subject. But I thought we just talked about that recently. Um, I thought when, just before we were uh, revising, doing one of the recent revisions in the EBRO, because we wanted to clarify... Brooks. Um, what about cisterns? How big of a cistern would yeah, that's you require? It's all fly. detailed in the UGR. In the, uh, per we um, one up on Fisher's 40,000 gallons, the other ones I think are 20s. I thought I we think think needed some clarification. Again, the, the, the UGRO is quite, is quite specific as yeah, I mean, to I think, the yeah. performance standards for... Yeah. I don't remember, and I wrote it, and I don't remember what it was. I don't remember exactly. I thought there was some clarification. There's a certain size that it has to be. During this last revision, when Shelley was helping us. Yeah, there was some... There it is. It's in uh, section AC, the chapter of uh, section, section one. thirteen, section thirteen, subsection AC. Residential life safety and fire suppression. Yeah. All subdivisions created on or after the effective date of this ordinance shall implement one of the following options to provide residential fire protection within the subdivision. A. Install within each dwelling unit of the defined ordinance the appropriate NFPA 13 sprinkler system. Two. Install or provide proof of deeded access to 40,000 gallon cistern with appropriate hydro constructed as outlined in subsection 4 and 5 and 6 below. Install or provide proof of, a, of needed access to a fire pond containing a minimum of 75,000 gallons of water with 40,000 gallons usable year-round supply in, stor uh, in storage as certified by the registered named licensed professional hydrologist or licensed professional engineer with appropriate hydrant constructed as outlined. Yeah. I think it was mostly the whole heated access part. 
Right, and, and then, but but at the time we weren't we, we didn't we didn't do that because we didn't have it because no 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 I, I mean that's yeah. part of the research and then and then it goes on further on it says fire ponds the purpose of the fire ponds shall be to meet a water supply requirement of 500 gallons per minute for the duration of two hours water delivery may be through either a dry or wet hydrant fire ponds shall be installed and maintained by the owner. Uh, do not have any trees, shrub, brush, or grass 14 inches or higher within 10 feet of its high water mark. Fire ponds shall be designed with a maximum of 2-1 slope bank and a minimum depth of 10 feet. So we have a lot of fire ponds that probably don't have a minimum depth of 10 feet. Fire pond storage levels shall be maintained at all times by a sustained water source. An overflow system shall be installed to handle the projected overflow a fire pond shall be dredged by owner if it becomes affected by vegetation and or silt as determined by the new fire department. Yeah, because I think within the discussions that we had during that revision, um, we talked about the fact that it would be up to the owner and whoever they gave deeded access to right. to decide whether or not the maintenance was going to be yeah. some sort of formal legal thing between the two of them. But as far as the town was concerned, the owner had to maintain it. Yeah. Right. And then, and then there's a restriction, there's a definition as how far away, literally and vertically, the fire pond and or a sister it could be within each 1,500 feet of the center line of the driveway. Right. Or 300 feet vertically max. Right. Right. So, so 500 yeah. gallons a minute for two hours That's is 60,000 gallons. Yeah. Right. So, so even in, even in the UDRO, it says you have to have forty thousand usable gallons. <laughs> Does it meet the other requirement that's in there? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, we work with you know. So that might be a, a little mop up detail to put down. Next time you guys are doing changes. Yeah. But at the time, I mean, there was nothing. You know, we had nothing. It was like I say, it was a letter from the fire department saying, you know, put in something, and most of the Developers comply. So, I mean, and so nowadays, it seems that most of it's going to be sprinkled. So, well, I mean, we, we, I've had, I mean, and I was huge on pushing sprinkling. You know, I mean, I worked really hard on that, and I got a, a few subdivisions to sprinkle, and then I got pushback from a lot of people. You know, like the people, you know, they said, no, we're not, we're not going to tell people to sprinkle. That's just too much money. But they'll spend seven eight hundred thousand dollars putting cisterns in, you know, instead of putting your sprinkler system in in your house, which is a matter of life safety. They'll put a hundred thousand dollars worth of glass in, but not twenty five. Well, our countertops are going to cost that. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But since but since the peaks, since the peaks, I think most of the subdivisions, not all of them, but you know, like certainly Merle Hill is requires. Fire uh, sprinklers. Well, no, didn't didn't Savage come in on that to try to say to try to right, push but, back on that? But that's typical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't say that. Yeah, that that was and there was there unofficially he was going to approach the board to replace the sprinkler requirement with cisterns in the lower part of Myrtle Hill. Um, I guess he ran it by Alan. Alan said, "I'm not going to." Yeah, Alan said no. We had that discussion. I, saying, I don't think he ever actually came before the board. No, 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 he never when did. Alan, and when Alan said I won't support that, yeah, I think yeah. he saw the writing on the wall right. and, yeah. and never, never, and never went anywhere. Yeah, no, he never right. actually came. The before. only, the only one that I know that that came back and it was fuzzies. Um, whatever the one Nichols got now, that's whatever it is. This Lock, this, Mountain, Lock States. Mountain States. Because Fuzzy was all about sprinkling. You know, after the fire down the mill, um, he was all about it. And then, then they came back and Nichols took it over and they said, no, we don't want to do this. We'll install fire ponds and cisterns or whatever. It's like, there, there is, again, there's a weak link there with, with sprinklers because, yes, the, uh, the building, the, there has to be a state approved license for the sprinkler when the building permit's issued. But then it's never inspected afterwards. Um, not with. If you use like a Wurzbo system, which is tied into your your domestic water, so if there's an issue, you will know that immediately. Right, but but but, if but, you have a but, black but my, the point I'm making is that a a 
a slide builder or homeowner could just sit there and say, okay, in construction, cut that out. Yeah. It never gets installed, and, it, and because we, there's no inspection, it never gets followed up on. No, I just say, I mean, it's just... Yeah, I think a lot of what's going on is owner A is all about the fire pond. Mm -hmm. But B and C and D <laughs> know nothing about it. Right. Yeah, it just sort of gets forgotten. Right. Or, or the HOA, you know, that never nobody in HOA ever reads the covenant to find out what the requirements are or the, <laughs> for the HOA. Yeah. Well, well, that's again, you know. Yeah. Especially after, especially after you have a couple of changes of leaderships in the HOA. Yeah. Well, we said we came a long way from yeah. where we were. Yeah. But, but, but now, but now, unfortunately, the, the, the challenge for the town is to get all the existing fire ponds cleaned up and into a good working order. Well, could the, what would be the, the the legal ramifications of the town having money? Don't go there, Gooch. And, and, well, do <laughs> don't go do there. a certain percentage of the ponds every year. That's that's is, that's probably there. that's probably the in practically or pragmatically, you know, anyway, it's really going to get taken care of. And the reality is, I mean, we this, this has been on the board for years and years and years. Does the town of Newry want to take over the responsibility of fire ponds? Well, oh, and that's that's where that is. The, the town has always washed their hands and said, nope, that's the developer. Let the developer and the association take care of their own stuff. They're the ones that are making money. Okay. Right. So, but, but years down the line now, though, you've got a homeowner who, second time, you know, who bought an already existing house, who has, you know, money into, a, into real estate, and it burns to the ground because there's no fire, fire water available. You know, there it's just sprinkled. Um, <laughs> you know, and 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 that's that's the reality of small town rural yeah. fire departments. Right. I mean, well, you know, because it could be like twenty minutes, a half an hour before you even get there. Yeah. So I mean, you know, and this is this is all the big, all the big issue. That's why I push sprinkling because it's a proven fact that you know, number one, they save lives, and number two, it greatly minimizes damage. Right. You know, so but um, the whole thing about the town getting involved. And going and maintaining fire ponds now, everybody would say like, "Oh, well, now I don't have to do anything. The new town of Nuri will take care of all that stuff." Yeah, that's on that. your tax bill. Yeah. They're going to start charging extra fire pond tax. Is that what they're going to do? No, well, it, gets, then, it gets blended in with the you know. So you just hide it. Well, sweep it like under, like sweep it under the tax carpet. Well, <laughs> I guess it would be a, an item on the town warrant. But. Yeah, and and, and 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 there are people. The town people, I'll bet you they wouldn't put up with it. You know, I, I, I honestly don't think so. And the other option is, is that the town then pursues legal action, which is costly and not necessarily a guarantee that it's still going to ever resolve in a fire pond or recuperation of legal fees if, you know, if it has to go to court. So, so look at it this way. What's it going to cost for... What's it going to cost to do five fire ponds a year versus what would it cost one lawsuit? Where would the lawsuit come from? The person whose house burnt down because the fire pond didn't work? Yeah, and grandma was in the house and. Well, who, what are they going to sue? The town. Yeah, everybody. has got deeper pockets. But, but, the, but the town doesn't have ownership of those. That's no, why. This is true. But the town didn't, you know. Get, get, get somebody to get it done. Right. Is that an enforcement issue at this point? Well, yeah, but that's but again, the enforcement is a little, is lacks teeth. Well, I'm guessing it's a because the only the only option you have is to take them to court, which is an expensive way to go. So if if a if a HOA or a homeowner is is refusing to do anything. 
I don't even know if that step's been taken, has it? Um, I don't think what? so. I don't. I'm not. I'm not aware of it. But then I'm not a town historian either. But, but, I'm sorry. But if, if that, that if anybody, if the town's ever pursued legal action against, or just a letter from the CEO, or well, what? that we have done. I I have sent many. Well, not many, but I have sent a, quite a few letters out to developers stating that you know your pond is at the stage that it is in now is becoming an unusable fire pond. And that will not provide you any fire protection within your 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 association. And sometimes they have taken some action and they have gone and done so. I mean, I say Roger. Um, you know, whatever Starwood. I sent a letter to like, what's the guy's name. Um, and he uh, he said, oh, he said, well, I'll have a dredge. Simple as that. But 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 nobody never nobody ever took care of the problem, which is the cattails. You know, like putting some type of an herbicide in there to to kill all that. Stuff. So, with the so in answer to your question, current this year, uh, the CEO has sent uh, letters to the Matterhorn and also to the owners on the fire pond at Monkey Brook. Um, that I know that one was cleaned up. I don't think it's been dredged. No, it hasn't been. And the fire and the, the Starwood one is a work in process. And I think she sent out. You can't tackle them all at she once. She sent out a three, a second and third notices to, to the Matterhorn, and I think it went to a second notice for the one in Monkey Book before they, got at least got the brush cleaned up and whatnot. But that's such a, you know, by by the plant by the subdivision plan that was going to be a ten thousand gallon fire pond to begin with. So it's. It was it was it, it was, was a failure was, right from the beginning. Was, yeah, it was it right from the very beginning. beginning. That thing failed, and and nobody would take up. You know, I try to say like, well, you fix it. Nope, it's done. That was a Dougie Wilson. So if if the town decides to take over maintenance of the fire ponds, then why would a developer choose to do sprinklers or cisterns? Or well, exactly. If the fire pond's much cheaper, and then they don't have to worry about it after it's built. Well, one is. New development, and the other one is maintenance of sins of the past. <laughs> right, but well, if, if you're going to maintain old ones, then I would think that you would also have to maintain new fire ponds. You, you would have to. You would have to. There is a danger there, President. So you have a good <laughs> argument there. Well, that's why I say that's why the town doesn't want anything to do with them. You know, right. Then, in fact, if the town shows shows that the town is actually spending taxpayer money to take care of them. Then somebody whose grandmother dies in the fire comes after the town. But right now, everything goes back to the association, and you know well, that the, they're the ones that were supposed to maintain their fire department. They also go after the town, and they'll go after the developer, and they'll go after the HOA. Well, right, right. Yeah. But the, the, the town shouldn't be held liable because it's got nothing to do yeah. with it. That's why they've never the, taken the only way around. If the town wanted to take care of the fire department, it would then be to create an ordinance such that it would. Be able to place a lien or, or, or seek reimbursement from the, from the responsible party for the maintenance that didn't wasn't performed. Right. So the town would do it, but then they would go after right. the right. developer right. for reimbursement. Right. I, I can see that. Right. Well, then it's the court thing, and there's like eating up money. Yeah. You know, wasted money because. And and, and, and here's an an interesting example. If you, one, if you look at the covenants for the colony. The, the covenants in the colony actually allows the town to come in in an emergency situation to clear culverts and other flooding issues and for the town to seek reimbursement from the HOA for that. I know because I've gone clean culverts before too. So, so that would be the same type of language that would have to be incorporated into the covenant for the HOA. Right. And then but you still end up, you know, having to have a lawyer, you know, paying for a lawyer's retirement fund so that you can go after the person. Lawyers always win. So, so you go back to, you know, supporting Bruce on the soapbox about fire about sprinklers. I tell you, man. Yeah.
And so I, I pushed it hard, hard, hard. And I've done, I've done, I've done a good job here, you know, in, in, in Europe. So it's, it's going to be a long, long process to try to get the fire ponds cleaned up. And hopefully our CEO and the town will continue to pursue it. Like I say, in the past, certain entities within this town have not bothered to raise a finger. So, yeah. Let the past be the past. Let the now be the now. Anyway, so interesting discussion that wasn't on the agenda. Should some of the, some of the teeth of enforcement and stuff be put in the ordinance, or is that not something that you would put in an ordinance? To sort of like... I got it, I don't know. You'd have to look... You'd have to... You'd have to have it carefully worded yeah. by reviewed by vetted by a, by the town lawyer. Right, exactly. Yeah. But it was but it was always I guess it was on a good faith maybe just on good faith that when dealing with these people that were doing this in town that it would be you know look you know would you build a fire pond you know let a, 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 this wasn't a never never requirement it was just you know a letter to the to the developer a letter from the fire department. And it was always just like, this is what we recommend. It was a recommendation. It was never anything more than that. And everybody complied with what it was. And so it was a good faith thing. It was what we were trying to work on. Yeah, we've got the big group. And we can see what's happened there. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. We've hashed over article number five. Let's go to number six. Open discussion. Continued UDR edits for campgrounds. I'd like to open with, I listened to the first campground meeting um, that Brooks posted on, on his website, or I believe the Newry website, and uh, it was very interesting. I didn't know a lot of things that came out. Um, was there a second meeting first? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's up too. That's up now too. Yep. Okay, I'll go looking for it. And the, the long and short of it, what we what we all agreed upon is that the, we, just, we we feel that the campgrounds should still only be able to be in the rural district in the town of Newry, not in the general nor the resort district. We all agreed upon that, and that's just pretty much as far as we got. <laughs> so then we're going to move on to some other stuff later. That's pretty much. What the tasking was, was it? Well, right, but I mean, it, and, and then it was to extrapolate from that. So now that we've decided that, then then do we bring that back to the planning and select board, or do we go further, like you know, uh, minimum size, density, but this, that, the other thing? Isn't that more of a planning board function? Than the, I don't think that was in the letter from the select board to the, that the select board approved. Brooks. Yes, uh, in the second video, I posted, a, I think, either a link or a picture of the state planning office's uh, guidelines for campgrounds, and it covers everything that we need to do. You know, as far as we just have to fit them into the district. <clears throat> Or say, like the committee said, you know, the RVs, big RVs, uh, <clears throat> they obviously, the issue at the Sunday River Valley was exit because there was only one way out and <clears throat> any RV campground would probably have to be in the flat land. <clears throat> so we figured that at uh, Bruce Powell's or the place at Upton <laughs> for the big RVs. We did, uh, Joel did research, find out that we did not adopt the scenic byway, but at one point uh, the scenic uh, byway was designated from just below the church up to uh, you know, through Grafton. <clears throat> but that starts, I guess it was rejected by the town, that starts at the Grafton line. Oh. Seeing there is no town 
members up there to be against it, they can do it. <laughs> 10 yes, 46 no. What's that? There were, there were 10 for it and 46 against it. Back in 2012. Yeah. And that was, you know, we don't want people to tell us what to do with our land type attitude. But still, our zoning districts reflect that uh, in where it's allowed. You know, it's allowed in the woods, basically. <clears throat> you know, it's allowed in the orange. <clears throat> so in other words, uh, with respect to White's Field, they could have a campground in where the old campground was. <clears throat> You know, where the camps are, in behind the field. They're allowed to do that now. They just aren't allowed to use the area. They can't use the area that's in orange. They have to use everything in, in the lighter color. That's all general. But I think that, you know, the planning board, my recommendation was look at the state planning office's uh, guidelines and go from there, fit it to our ordinance, because that... I'm sorry, I thought camp, I thought you said that you guys want to continue to have campgrounds in the rural district. Yes. So the rural district is white, not orange. Well, white, that's why I right. said that the orange is, is the general development. The, the dark orange is the, the... light orange is general development. The resort area is the dark orange. Yeah. Right. The lighter so, orange is the general, and the other white is so the white resort, is, uh, uh, rural. Yeah, okay, I thought you were saying that it was in the world. No, you said that. Sorry. You said that. Pardon me. I thought he was doing well to read the map from as far away across the room as he was. Yeah. Um, so, well, we are we are meeting again at the beginning in, in January. We're going to have another meeting. So, that will be something that we're working on. And we'll see what, see what we say. I mean, we'll just come back to and say, like, this is what we get, we've come up with. Okay, it's here. It's on your lap now. <laughs> you guys can hash out the rest of it, the details. Well, basically, we wanted the, a committee to say, where can we have campgrounds? And so far, you said the same place you've got them now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, like it was mentioned, uh, you could probably put... Uh, mobile home park in the field. So, you know, there, you know, the ordinance could be tightened up with specific. Well, a mobile home park is a dwelling, and there, the UDRO pretty well specifies the amount of land per dwelling that you're going to have. So it would be... It would be cluster development. It would be a cluster development, which is a quid quo quo between you know common area for the good of the people to denser housing mm -hmm. and then of course you got the new state law that allows that gives up yeah that throws, throws everything into a state of disarray for, for affordable housing so. yeah and the legislature just Reconvened in their first article is affordable housing. Oh, I thought it was the fuel oil. Well, <laughs> second, I but yeah, it's well, it's there. So who knows what's going to come out of that? Yeah, I, I had drafted a uh, a new definition for campgrounds, and I had sent it to Joelle, but I think she misplaced it because she didn't print it out, and I don't have a copy of it, so. That will have to wait for the next. Okay. In the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, Brooks? No. No. Other than uh, I, I just want to reiterate. I think that you guys are the ones to make it fit into the ordinance because you've been working on it. Uh, 
which was the plan all along anyway, was to, for the land use part of it for us to do. The question for the committee was which development zone should allow campgrounds. Then there was a discussion on, uh, and I don't know how, if anybody's researched it, uh, how Moe's campground was passed the way that it is. But uh, I'm quite sure that it, hers is in resource protection or some, or well, she went through the planning board, and she got uh, and she got a shoreline permit. Yeah. So it was all reviewed. Yeah. Way back when. So. Yeah, she's grandfathered. Actually, actually, she went came to the, to the planning board. Yeah. And got and it got reviewed. Yeah. She would be grandfathered if you guys. Oh yeah, if we changed anything, but she'd be grandfathered. She right. Yeah. It appears she's entirely in Shoreland zone. Well, and, and, and surprisingly enough, her application came in a couple months after the Shoreland zoning ordinance was approved. <laughs> and I think campgrounds are actually allowed in Shoreland. They are, and, and the only, in, our, in the town ordinances, it's only the shoreline zoning ordinance that that has land use parameters for campgrounds. Yeah. Basically, it's it's five thousand square feet per site. Right. And that setbacks from water, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I mean, Mark Mark wasn't dumb about that stuff when he when he went through that whole thing and did it. Um, No, he's been in enough campgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now this is just pens for next year then. Yep. Chair is in deep thought. Well, it's just, you know, the UDRO is quite an extensive document and all of a sudden, a couple months ago, we discovered campgrounds? Yeah. What do you mean campgrounds? <laughs> well, and, and I, I, we still need to come up whether, you know, again, which development zone allows campgrounds is immaterial. We still need to come up with some land use parameters for campgrounds. Yeah, we do. And, right. and, right. and I've been lazy. I haven't touched it much lately, but I, it's on my books to start to work on that worksheet that we came up and reviewed. At the last meeting, I started to come up with something. That was a good sheet. It uh, yeah. stimulated the, the neurons, did it? Yeah, the little black cells. Yeah. Well, and, and we all made a bunch of copies and we planned to pass them all out, so now the, the campground committee has that right, sheet. Right, but, that, but that's way beyond what the committee is supposed to be doing anyway. Right, but, but it's still for, for food for thought and good ideas, right. yeah. Should that get extrapolated upon? I don't know. If, if that's it for campgrounds, I have one other item I'd like to bring up. Okay. I would like to put some feelers out to the rest of the board as to thoughts of uh, pursuing a moratorium on major, minor, and site plan developments north of the post office in the Sunday River Valley. And the reason for this is that our, the intersection of Sunday River Road and Speedway Road several times a year is chock-a-block full and is a accident it's a, it's a liability waiting to happen. Uh, you have, with the increasing traffic on Monkey Brook, during peak periods, we have more and more and more vehicles trying to make a left-hand turn from Sunday River Road at that stop sign, while you have traffic coming down from 
Ski way. Or in the morning, or in trying the, to get out. Or, or if you, or if you're, and I'll speak of personal experience as a, as a shuttle driver for the, the mountain. When I come down in the morning or the evening, and I have to get to that intersection, I'm sitting in the middle of the intersection to make a left-hand turn, and cars entering Sunday, coming in from Sunday River Road, are blind because they're coming around that bend just at the post office. And very often, they're not expecting to find a Bluebird bus sitting in the middle of the road staring at them. Uh, and I've had several close calls with head-on collisions there, as I, and I've seen other several close calls. So, the, if we go back to the comprehensive plan that was approved back in 2005, almost a fortnight ago, <laughs> um, um, it, one of the, the tasks was for the town and the resort to pursue some resolution to the traffic situation on Sunday River Road. And, there, and that actually breaks down to two parts. One which is first responders access, and the other one is traffic safety, which is primarily at that intersection. Actually, since 2005, DOT did reconstruct that intersection. Because, well, my understanding is the DOT line is just prior to that intersection. And, and you might be right. Uh, I, I know DOT spent the money on it. Right. Well, they did, because they, they, they put the, the, the two lanes coming down, so you could, you could go left and you could have a double lane going right. there. Right. And my my <laughs> is, as, if, you look at, if you look at the 2030 plan for the resort, it's clear that, and you, and you see what's happening at Merrill Hill, and without a doubt, Merrill Hill 2 is going to be coming here shortly, plus other developments up there, plus the develop, opening up the Western Reserve. Uh, oh, what's the Western Reserve? The Western Reserve so is the ski, ski slopes yet to be conceived in the Jordan area or even further west in Jordan. So you, so you got Jordan here and then you got you know Gilead over here and then they just they're, they're gonna head right towards Gilead. Right up the Larry Brook. <laughs> okay. um, so the, the, no, they don't care whether you can get in and out. They just want to make sure you get your dollars with you. Yeah <laughs> my, my crystal ball is saying there's just gonna be more and more and more traffic on Monkey Brook Road coming into Sunny River Road and then having to go through that intersection. I mean they've got to hire police to come out and direct traffic. For, for on busy weekends or vacation weekends, uh, perhaps it's time to draft someone in the town to draft a letter to DOT, uh, alerting them of such things to and having them do a traffic study. You know, all the little hoses across the road. Yeah. It, it's a it's a it's a challenging intersection because for a good part of the year, it's sleepy hollow. Yeah, exactly. But, but for twenty week well for fifteen weekends until they get until they get their but, summer figured out. But last last year, there was it was it was gridlock from Route Two to the resort several weekends. No, no, right after Mallard Mark. Okay, yeah. all the way. <laughs> yeah, there, there were there were a couple of times I would come out and it was Mallard Mark. Mm -hmm. That was that the traffic was backed up to. Coming into the valley. Yeah. Yeah, I've, so I remember years ago they had somebody directing traffic at the brewery. Yeah, well that's what I'm saying. They they, they still do. They no, still do. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then it was always fun. And I looked they, at this from they do. Smith. They we they have I've, enforcement. They they have they have had in certain how recent how recent I've, I've seen them out. I saw them out there last year. I mean, is it, sorry, I think it's certain events. Maybe he's. I can't. I can't see either the sheriff or the scoopers doing it without being compensated. Oh, I'm sure they get compensated by the mountain. Okay. But I just remember when I was back in the early '90s when I started the Sunday River and and I was told about the Roger Smith early morning or early morning commuting game. And they see Roger. You know, Roger drives about four miles an hour. Anyways, you don't know Roger, do you? Yeah. And uh, you know Roger. 
I know right. Roger, and you know Roger. And he said, he said that Roger would kind of go along, you know, as usual, six or seven miles an hour, and just kind of drift off to the end of the car, but butt, butt up right under his butt, you know, and want to pass him, he just kind of, you know, kind of slide and slowly go back and forth. <laughs> and he'd pull into the end on his way to work, and he'd give up, and get out, and he'd count the car, and he backed up. <laughs> so the question, the question is, who is the appropriate town entity to send a letter to DOT to alert them of such? I would think it would be a collaboration with Red and Joel. Okay. And so I, mean, I mean, Joel's already, Joel's already the one that's really kind of on it about that. You know, ingress, egress. So, um, but, but I... You're, 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 you're right. I mean... There's a lot of traffic, and there's only one way in and out. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's even it. if there were a second way out, I don't think most skiers would utilize it. Hey, well, that it's it's they're related, but they're two separate issues. Yes, you have the egress exit of the valley as one. And you have an inter a very dangerous intersection as another. They're both related, but they're separate issues. Actually, there's two dangerous intersections. The Monkey Brook Sunday River Road intersection isn't much better. No, it's not. It's just less traffic at this point. At this, right, right at now. this point. Right at now. this point. And unless you have a major development on Sunday River Road beyond that intersection, it's never probably going to have that big of an issue is, you know, if, if we were to, you know, if the rivers would get a ski area over behind outward bound, yes, then you would have traffic making left-hand turns there. That's a savage though. Well, I remember. Well, no, it's not. Back, it's on the Sunday River. It's Sunday back, River back, and but yes, I, 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 but I think that's a lesser one. The, the primary one right now is is the Skiway and Sunday River Road, yeah. and and it's just it's just a matter of time before there is a. And they're still developing up there. <laughs> no, I mean, and Merrill Hill's taken off, and Savages haven't gotten started yet, really. So no, the, I guess the next question is, is Powder Ridge built out? No. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't think it's completely well, built out. If you you got you got. You got Powder Ridge, you got Mahusik Glen, which all the lots are sold, but very few are built out. All the lots are sold in there? I think pretty much all the lots are sold in wow. Mahusik Glen. You have Myrtle Hill, which is both upper and lower are approaching 50% sold. Now you say upper and lower. You saying like it's Sunday River piece and Savage piece? Right. Mer Merle Hill, for all practical purposes, is two developments now. Right. But even though legally it's one, and and there are some things that Sunday River does in order to make it keep that happy legally. But in effect, at least for me, pragmatically, it's you, the lower the lower lots are Savage. Yeah. And the upper lots are Sunday River. Both of them are approaching fifty percent. By the registry of deeds with transfers. Wow. I didn't know Savages is but I mean I drove through there the other day and it was just they were just, they're they're still working their infrastructure, so well that Savage will be working the infrastructure until the end. As opposed to, you know, Sunday River, I have to give them credit, you know, they they in and they they paved the roads, you know, they've done everything like close closer to the UDRO requirements than than um, select your curb, cut and go to town. <laughs> but but you know, adjacent to Merle Hill there's another forty acres that 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 Boyne owns. There's a forty acres that another property owns, which is between Monkey Brook and Merle Hill, which was currently logged, but that could be developed. You got the, uh, the the subdivision off the what is it off the green or whatever? Village off the green. Village off the green. What was that? Was that was that Dana's? No. 
what do they call native development? The one the, up, 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 up the monkey broke, broke their fight the golf course. That's village off the green. That is. Rivers development. Well, I know, but they, they call it Dana because Dana bought a house on there or, or a lot or something. Yeah, yeah. Dana and Simon Dumont. Yeah. But you got that one there, you, and then you, plus, more importantly, with the Jordan 8, and we'll find out in 10 days' time when that opens, how that's going to affect the traffic on Monkey Brook. Is the anticipation is is that a lot of a lot of the diehard skiers are going to go straight to the lower parking lot in Jordan to get onto the Jordan 8, as opposed to going to Southridge and working their way over to the western part of the resort. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and to facilitate that, they've cut trails down to the parking lot and from the parking lot to the lift. So you'll be able to ski out of the parking lot and ski back to the parking lot. I don't know if they're yet. By the way, the board approved before my time. That came before the board. Pretty much came. Was that before I came by? It was before my time, but it didn't come before It didn't come by the board. So my concern is well, I got both the egress egg. The egress and the exit of the valley is is of concern, but more importantly, my concern is that intersection, and what can we do to promote getting a resolution to that? I would I would I wouldn't uh, object for moratorium. You already put in the first traffic light. No. Well, the, the, again, you 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 got the well, you got the issue with the sporadic traffic. Well, the, with the modern lights that have cameras, that, or or, can, sen or sensors and whatnot. Yeah, if it, sen if it senses there's nobody here, right, it sends them right through. Right. Blinking. But the, the other, the other, right. the other issue that would be nice to address is the, the the rate of speed, the rate of travel, the speed of travel on Sunny River Road. You got to get there, man. That's right. Time's a wasting. You've been skiing all day with no speed limit signs. When you hop in your car, there's no speed limit signs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know whatever you know, whether it's a traffic light, a roundabout, or what have you, I don't know. But it'd be. Oh. <laughs> you don't want a roundabout, <laughs> no. I was just thinking of a roundabout there with a school bus. <laughs> well, you know, modern day roundabouts are designed for tractor trailers and school buses. It's big enough. Oh no, it's not big enough. It, yeah. You design it such that the school buses and the tractor trailers ride up on top of the island yeah. to go around. You know, you don't think of rotary. Rotary is one of those big gigantic things that doesn't work very well. A roundabout is small and compact, especially if it's a single lane, single lane road. Yeah. Yeah. I have to buy some houses there. <laughs> and I don't know if there's even, you know, again, uh, hopefully a DOT would be open to go in there and do something like that. But no, no, like they'd probably come down and do a study in the May, in the middle of May when there's no... <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. End of April. Well, I, it, having... Hoses across the road in the winter time is like the, yeah the plows that doesn't work with the plows yeah, so but I don't know if you could have like you know electric eyes or, so, yeah. or something to that effect or volunteers <laughs> yeah. yeah that wouldn't be able to count yeah. the count anyway, well. I again I whether or not who what where but it'd just be so, be nice to be able to you know besides read about it in the comprehensive plan that was done 23 years ago. But the hoses are only down for a couple of days, so they could put the hoses down for like. But they could even make them put up cameras, yeah, you know, that, and record video, and just yeah. you know, then you you can analyze it that way. Yeah, yeah you're gonna, you you could conceivably leave them up there all winter. GoPro. That right there. GoPro. GoPros. There you go. Yeah, you, know, you just have to have somebody. You know, it's it's got to be data that can be analyzed without a lot of manpower. Well, I suppose with a GoPro, and you just feed it into a computer, and every time it sees a license plate, it counts it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure somebody could write that program. 
I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. And well, it might take five GoPros on that intersection to, you know, catch all of what, you, what is, you need to see. Is this something that the board wants to discuss further with other officers of the town, or or is it just my? No, I, I would be happy to entertain that. I really would. I mean, I think you need to start doing something. We need to start looking at something. Because I'm not, it's I'm not so sure a moratorium is the correct way to go, because I think if it happened, and let's say we had a moratorium for two years, we would suddenly be looking at a lot of long nights, because we've got this umpteen subdivisions to look at Well, when it, when it came off. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the moratorium. Well, that, plus it probably would be a lot. Well, we were talking, there was talk about a moratorium on buildings or subdivisions. And it's like, no. Mm. No. <laughs> well, and then you're going to see the pile up of everybody. Everybody's going to be, be putting their stuff up for sale. Well, no, if you, if you had a moratorium on new structures, it's like saying, huh, there's the problem. And you can't build, so. You bought your land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Probably pretty, I only recall the board talking about moratorium when it came to marijuana and stuff. And oh, I, we already and talked about it for the the, the borough bridge. For the what? The mining. Oh, yeah, for the mining. Right, right. Those right. two. Yeah. I actually went to one town meeting in in, in Perry. And what? The moratorium went to town meeting in no. Missouri. Oh, I did. No. Which is kind of sad because the scale, I saw an article the other day about this in a, <clears throat> in a national magazine. This is the largest single deposit of lithium in the world. Well, what's it? Isn't there another deposit somewhere further north or something in Maine? Not lithium. Not like this. Not like this. <clears throat> and. The, uh, you know, the current owners, do you think that they're just going to take their little trucks and haul it truck at a time to swathe these? That isn't the bottom line of this whole thing. <laughs> but as it turned out, we ended up having time to put a, a ordinance together and get it passed. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought there was some verbiage in the ordinance. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, actually, it's, actually, the, the ordinance was more of who, what, where, and when. Right? Yeah. And thankfully, the state of Maine has the strictest mining laws in the country, so, which is a blessing in disguise, I guess. And you, sitting here with your two lithium-ion powered cell phones. On the yeah. Table. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. And if one isn't enough, you got to have two. Well, I know. Well, one of them kind of keeps me alive, so, you know, it's like, I like that one. <laughs> What's the other one do? No, it's my phone. <laughs> but actually, they, they both communicate information for me for diabetes. So just one 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 is carries the information for blood sugar monitoring. The other one is the other the, the one for um, administration of insulin. This one. This you one. can't merge them together. No. Well, I can't. This one is is what what they've done now is actually which is kind of neat is that. This one will tell me, like, I've had something to eat and I had to change a pot and a, a sensor, so my blood sugars are way screwed up. Um, but I have a, a, a monitor which, which, which monitors glucose, and now I have a pod which administers the insulin. And now the two of them talk to each other a little bit, not quite a lot, but a little bit. So it sounds like a marriage. It will, <laughs> it will see, like, either a rapid increase in, in insulin and create more of a basal uh, basal flow of insulin for me then and, and say like if also I'm, I'm crashing it'll it'll stop the basal um, which is the, the the insulin that that's, I get 24 hours a day on, on a regulated level so you know it's pretty it's pretty interesting so the bionic man <laughs> yeah well someday after, after I get all my joints replaced there yeah, I will be Mr. Chairman, any motion in view of the fact that we have not received any applications for consideration before this board in the near future, I move that we 
do not meet on December 21st. Second. And move our next meeting to the first Wednesday of January of 2023. Second is finished. It's been moved and seconded that we dispense with the, with the meeting on the 21st of December 2022 and have the meeting on the first Wednesday in January 2023. Do we Although, know what Wednesday that is? Uh, yeah, Wednesday. <laughs> no, I mean, do we know what, what day? Uh, what, the first Wednesday? And it's going to be like the 4th or something like that. Um, it's, it's the 4th. Wednesday is the 4th. Yeah. Okay, Wednesday January the 4th of January 2023. Well, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't like the 1st or something. You know, cause mm -hmm. Very well, Christ, Christmas is Saturday, so that means the first is going to be Monday or Tuesday or something like that. 23. All those in favor? One, two, three, and it is carried. You should all be happy with that. You know, and by then you will be. have, no, you will not have had another meeting of the, the, the yeah. campground people. No, we're meeting um, the ninth, I think, or the or the. Or the, or the uh, that would be the Wednesday the 11th. Meeting. We're meeting Wednesday the 11th. Okay. Yeah. It'll be the following Wednesday. Yeah. Do we want to postpone the meeting from the first Wednesday to the second Wednesday, to the third Wednesday? We can't quite do that yet because there might be an application that's submitted within the two week time frame. Okay. We will discuss that. So in the future, that, that can be done via email in the first week of January. <laughs> okay, we can do that. And I guess that the uh, ice castle yeah. went, went away. What's not happening? Well, yeah, well we got back, they didn't get back to us. No, and Julie's gone, yeah. so. Well, the weather hasn't quite cooperated either. <laughs> Create more traffic <laughs> through two not good intersections. Uh, I I am entertaining a motion to adjourn. Well, second. Yeah. I make a motion that we adjourn. I'm seconding your motion to adjourn. And I'll vote for it. Second, we <laughs> we adjourn. One, two, three, and uh, it's done. It is 7 12. That's the volume I thought it would. Yeah, we got to away fire oh, Well, I, as well as we should. Yeah. I mean, someone thought they were important enough to build them, but no one thought they were important enough to maintain them. Well, I did, but I just, you know, I didn't know how to go about doing it, I guess. Well, you know? We yeah, asked well, the, we asked the people to do it. Well, by, by then the saddlebags are full of money in here and the developer is riding over the horizon. Yeah.